My talk today really is about uh, the Hippocratic Oath, and in particular, that one sentence, a deadly drug I will not give, even if I am asked, nor will I suggest this plan of action, this course. And um, I'm going to try to contextualize that part of the oath and also to argue on behalf of it, to argue a, a very specific uh, claim, just simply that physicians ought not to kill. Physicians ought not to be uh, uh, orient themselves towards deliberate taking of the life of their patient or of anyone for that matter. And of course, um, the reason people would think, well, physicians should kill is because they, they would be good at it, right? So that conception of medicine as a technique that would orient, that say, well, we could just, we just have a technique in medicine and it could be oriented towards all sorts of different uh, goals, health or killing, either one or the other. And I wanna argue that no, medicine as a profession, as something associated with a promise, is really oriented exclusively towards health. Uh, it has a goal, a specific goal, and that killing would, would undermine that orientation towards that unique goal of medicine and, and the profession of medicine. So um, now I speak, I just wanna you know, put a little caveat here. I speak of the Hippocratic Oath I attributed to Hippocrates. Whenever we attribute anything to Hippocrates, we have to do so with a little asterisk because we know that Hippocrates lived around 470 BC. He was a contemporary of the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates, but we, we can't really for sure, we, and we know he wrote things, we know he taught, we know he gave lectures, we know he had a, founded a school of medicine, we know that he opened up medicine to um, members who were not, uh, who, who were not, did not have a father who was a physician. And we know he did that, we did all sorts of things. But we don't know if he wrote anything he wrote for sure. So when I say the Hippocratic Oath, there's reason to think that he could have written the oath. I think he did myself, I make arguments for that. But um, I just wanna note that at the outset that that attribution always has to be done with a little bit of a, of a grain of salt, right? A little asterisk there. So I wanna approach the prohibition against killing by looking at the symbol of medicine, right? So the symbol of medicine is something with which you are familiar, but it is a kind of strange symbol if you think about it. Um, it's a snake on a stick, on a, on a stick. And I wanna approach the prohibition against killing by looking at that symbol and, and why is a snake there? Uh, I think if, if uh, you were to uh, have an assignment uh, to come up with a symbol of medicine, and if you were in a group and one of your members said, well, let's put a snake on a stick and let's have that be the symbol of medicine. I think you think, well, I don't think that's a very good idea. Uh, snakes are usually associated with wounding, not with healing. But what I want to argue is that precisely as a wounder, the snake is an apt symbol of medicine. And actually the Greeks thought that to some extent. But um, let's look at the symbol. It's a, it's a snake around a walking stick. Uh, that, that is a walking stick that we're looking at. There we see the statue of Asclepius and then just the snake on a, on a, on a walking stick there. Why a walking stick? Well, we know that the ancient Greek physician was, in their own terms, epidemiological. They went epi around Damia, the, the cities, the villages. They went from one village to another. They were uh, itinerant physicians, many of them walked from one city to another. So of course they would have a walking stick. That explains the stick, but then what about the snake? Why have a snake? And there are probably a number of reasons why snakes are apt symbols of medicine. Um, the first thing I wanna note though, just uh, if you, sometimes now as a teacher, I have to have learning outcomes. I have to, what did my students learn today? So I can point to this one learning outcome, hopefully, that uh, you, you'll realize that the caduceus, which is two snakes, is actually not the symbol of medicine, although it's often affiliated with medicine, associated with medicine. The caduceus, which is this uh, symbol we're looking at right now, is really the, uh, the rod of Hermes or of Mercury, the messenger of the gods, the Greek gods. And it was confused, especially, I'm sorry to say, in the United States of America, which is where I'm from, uh, it was confused with the, uh, with the staff of Asclepius, which is that, that symbol uh, there. We're looking there at the staff of Asclepius. 
Here we're looking at the caduceus, the rod of Hermes or Mercury, the messenger of the gods. And um, it was confused uh, with, this, with med the medical symbol in part because it was found on, it's really a symbol for uh, printers. It was used as a symbol for printers that they were messengers of the gods. And so it would be found on textbooks, including medical textbooks. And so in the United States, people jumped to a conclusion when there were medical textbooks imported from Great Britain from the House of Churchill, who was a medical uh, textbook publisher. Uh, the, the colonists and, and uh, Americans in general thought, oh, that must be the symbol of medicine. And in fact, it's, it's not the symbol of medicine, although it's often confused with the symbol of medicine. That, so that could be kind of your learning outcome for the day, if you will, that you learn that that is not the symbol of medicine. But, um, but we get back to our question, which is why have a snake as a symbol of medicine? There are a number of reasons, one of which is uh, the phenomenon of ecthesis, which means the shedding the, of the entire skin. It's very interesting that uh, snakes, of course, molt their entire skin at one time. And if you've ever seen this, if you've ever seen the, the uh, sloughed off snake skin, it's pretty remarkable. Um, because it's just, an, it's a hole, it's like an inverted sock. And so snakes are thought to have the ability to, to heal themselves, right? They're thought to have the ability to heal themselves. Um, and that would, of course, make them an apt symbol for medicine. Also, uh, we see there the slide of chthonic. The snakes, that's a Greek word meaning of the earth, right? So snakes are of the earth, on the earth, in the earth. They would know the earth. They would know its healing properties, presumably. So this would be another reason why uh, they might be a, a fitting symbol for medicine. Um, now, another reason is an actual disease, uh, Dracunculus medinensis, which means the little dragon of Medina. Uh, it's, it's also known as guinea worm. It's a parasitic, uh, it's a parasite. And it's, uh, it's indigenous to Medina, which is a city in modern day Saudi Arabia. And it's, it's a disease that we've known, that's been known of for millennia. Um, and what happens if you, if you drink contaminated water, the, uh, the larva, the guinea worm larva will hatch in, in one's intestinal tract. And then finally, the, the, the worm uh, will wend its way down to one's extremities, usually the, the legs and it will it will create a boil and it will exit uh, from that boil right so it's pretty nasty we can treat it currently with uh, with uh, drugs but uh, one historic treatment of the guinea worm was to take a little slender stick and get the worm to wrap itself around the stick and you could um, you could remove that from the victim. Uh, and, and that, and that uh, treatment is even used to this day, uh, although it's not the favorite treatment, it is used to this day. So medical historians think perhaps that, that little stick with the worm around it came to be a symbol of physicians, right? So that's a, that's a reason some people think perhaps that's why we have a snake uh, uh, on a pole uh, symbolizing medicine. And I think here, I would say, as the Italians would say, se non è vero, è bene trovato. That is, if it's not true, at least it makes for a good story. Um, but I want to look at um, a, a reason that I think it looms large in having the snake symbolize medicine. And that is the, the phenomenon of homeopathy, homeopathic. It's a Greek word. The ancient Greeks were aware of homeopathy. Of, of homeopathic remedies. Homeo is, means similar and pathos means sickness. So a homeopathic remedy, the, the very uh, general idea is to treat similar things with similar, uh, similarly, right? So cold with cold, hot with hot, things like that. But also uh, the notion of homeopathy would be to take a substance that induces sickness in a healthy person, it induces, um, symptoms similar to a sickness in a healthy person and to use that to treat a sick person or to pre prevent disease, right? So something like vaccination would be an example of a homeopathic, in a very gross overarching way, is a kind of homeopathic remedy because 
what you're doing is you're using a little bit of a disease to protect against disease. We've, this has been known about for millennia that, that this phenomenon of homeopathy. Uh, one example, this is a depiction. This uh, is a depiction uh, by um, Dep Depuy. Uh, it's, it's probably around 1800. It was, uh, uh, it's a watercolor. It's in the Wellcome Trust um, collection. But um, the origin of the vaccination, now that's not exactly historically accurate. I mean, but, but what we're looking at here is probably a depiction of Edward Jenner there in the, uh, in the, uh, in the blue, uh, looking at uh, uh, Sarah Nelm's um, smallpox infection, right? So she, she had a smallpox infection and, or excuse me, cowpox, cowpox infection. And Jenner, and as, as many people knew at the time, and this is right around 1796, May of 1796, Jenner uh, and many others knew as well for centuries, this has been known that kind of cowpox would, would uh, protect against smallpox. So what Jenner vaccinated a young boy, uh, Phipps, uh, in May of uh, 1796, against using um, uh, material from Nelms, he, he vaccinated Phipps, a little boy, a little eight-year-old boy, against smallpox. Uh, and the, the cowpox actually proved efficacious against uh, uh, getting smallpox, which is much worse uh, disease than cowpox. So in any case, that, that's the homeopath, that's an instance of homeopathy. Uh, but the Greeks, they, they understood homeopathy and they had an aphorism to the effect that the wounder heals. Now, now we're getting really into territory where we're talking about why, why prohibit the physician from killing. And, and the, the Greeks were aware of, they had this saying, it was amongst their sayings, like they had no thesei auton, which is know thyself or moderation in all things. And they also had this saying, the wounder heals, the wounder heals. And this was a, a, a widespread uh, in, their, in their culture. It would have been an aphorism that they were all familiar with. And it was affiliated with a story. Um, if we look at this, uh, the cover of my book on Hippocratic Oath, that's a depiction. It's a very strange, if you look at that sculpture, it's a bas relief, so a shallow relief sculpture. Um, what we're looking at here is Achilles healing Telephus. Okay, so this is the, this is a, this, this particular sculpture is in Naples, Italy, in the National Museum. It was found in a villa in Herculaneum. Uh, it was buried by the explosion of Vesuvius in 79 AD, and uh, it depicts Achilles uh, scraping. You can see what he has there in his left hand is his spear, and what he's doing with that very sharp object, uh, the knife there, he's scraping filings from his spear into a wound in Telephus's abdomen. Telephus, of course, on the right, he's seated. Um, and you look at that, and you're like, well, is he, what is he, is he harming this man? Is he helping this man? He has these two very sharp objects against his abdomen, right? What he's doing is scraping these filings into uh, Telephus's abdomen. Okay, why is he doing that? What's, what's the story? Well, this is, this story, it, it's the tragedy of Telephus. It was told by each of the three great Greek tragedians, Sophocles, Aeschylus, and uh, Euripides each told this, they each had written a, uh, a, uh, a tragedy entitled Telephus. And what had happened in the story is that uh, Achilles, when he was going to, uh, to Troy, he first, uh, he mistook Telephus's city for Troy and he attacked Telephus's city and Telephus successfully defended against the attack by Achilles. But Achilles wounded Telephus. And this wound, after Achilles left and, and the Greeks left, this wound would not heal. And even to this day, in surgery, you might call a, a wound that will not heal Telephian, right, in reference to this story, this particular story. So Telephus, being a good Greek, a, a pious Greek, he went to the Delphic Oracle uh, at Delphi, the priestess of Apollo, who was the god of healing, uh, and 
asks, well, how is this going to be? How am I going to be healed? And the goddess, the priestess, excuse me, the priestess said, the wounder heals. The wounder heals. That's where this aphorism enters into Greek culture and captures their imagination. The wounder heals. So the wounder, of course, was Achilles. So Telephus went to Achilles and, and said, well, I, you, I've been told that you will heal me. And Achilles said, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a warrior, not a doctor. But the wise Odysseus said, oh, no, what the, the uh, priestess is telling you is you have to heal him with your spear. So then we get this scraping of the filings into, into um, the, the wound of, of Telephus, and Telephus is healed, of course. Now, the, uh, you can see this is kind of homeopathic, right? The, the, the object that caused the wound will heal. It's, it's also get, gets at this idea that the wound or heals, but also this would suggest, I think, why a snake, which is often affiliated with wounding, would make an apt symbol of healing, of medicine, right? That's, that's why that would make sense. Why would the Greeks have the snake symbolize medicine, the wounder? Why would the wounder symbolize medicine? Well, because the wounder heals, right? Now, what's curious, what's very curious is it's not, you might think, well, they were pagan Greeks and, and they would have snakes uh, and, and I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable around snakes. I don't understand why we should keep that symbol or, uh, but it's also striking that within, uh, within the Jewish, the Hebrew scriptures, we also find a snake, right, affiliated with healing and actually causing healing. This is uh, what we're looking at here is the Moses in the desert, right? point towards the Nehushtan, which the brazen serpent, right, which that Nehushtan means like the, the bronze serpent, the brazen, the brazen thing. Um, let me just read a little bit uh, from the Hebrew scriptures. This is from the book of Numbers, um, but what, what's going on here? Um, uh, so the people are complaining to Moses. They're in the desert. We're, this is from the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 21, verse 4. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So here we have, uh, of course, if you think of the story of Genesis, the, the serpent is, of course, the one who causes all sorts of problems. Uh, well, the, here the serpent is actually a a symbol of healing, but also a cause of healing, right? So again, we have, curiously, in the Hebrew culture, we have the serpent uh, on, a, on a staff symbolizing healing. Um, and, and in Christianity, just to reference another uh, you know, tradition, um, that uh, Christ references the serpent in the desert and compares himself to the serpent. says, when I am lifted up, you know, those who look upon me will be healed, right? So we have um, the serpent on a, a, uh, a serpent symbolizing medicine, really precise the wounder, right? Because in the, in the Hebrew scriptures there, the serpents were the ones who were wounding, but they're also going to be the source of healing. And that's the idea that the wounder heals, right? Now, what concerns Hippocrates, okay, what this gets to the heart of our concern here is, well, if the wounder heals, then that also means that the healer wounds, right? That's what I would call the isomorphic principle or the mirror image, or it's, it's uh, entailed by the homeopathic principle. If the, the wounder heals, then it's also by that very, uh, the logic of that, it's also going to be true that the healer wounds because the wounder, of course, is a healer. So that means that the healer is a, it could, is a wounder, right? The, what I call the iatrogenic principle. And this is what Hippo Hippocrates is preoccupied with. He wants to make sure that the wounder, that the healer does not become a wounder, 
right? He wants to he wants to constrain the healer so that the healer only heals, does not become a wounder, because he knows that healing and wounding are intimately related, right? He knows that ancient Greek aphorism that the wounder heals, but it also means that the healer can wound. And, and how can a healer wound, right? Oh, just think about the, uh, the word iatrogenic. Iatros means physician and genic means caused by. So of course, an iatrogenic disease or disorder is one that has been caused by a physician. So think of the first type of wounds of what I call wounds of therapy, right? So uh, medicine always involves things like cutting, cauterizing, drugging, burning. Um, and whenever you do that, those are wounds of therapy, right? We can make them smaller. We can make them less painful. We can try to mitigate them as much as we can, but they're always going to really accompany even excellent medicine will be accompanied by these wounds of therapy, right? Um, we know that drugs always have some deleterious effect. We're always seeking the beneficial effect, but they always have some side effects that are obnoxious and that we'd like to avoid, but we're unable to. So those wounds of therapy are kind of part of, part of even excellent medicine. And um, Hippocrates would say, well, we should try to reduce them, eliminate them as much as we can, but they're going to accompany even, even good medicine. Uh, another form of wounding would be just errors, right? So here we have, you can see these two uh, capsule bottles of, uh, this is a drug for uh, tuberculosis. Um, we have on the left, we have 150 milligrams in each capsule. On the right, we have 300 milligrams in each capsule. You can see how, and this actually did result in a medical error, giving twice the dose to a patient. Uh, fortunately, the patient just suffered a, like a redness, but, um, but uh, oftentimes uh, things like that result in real harm to patients. So errors in therapy are, are also one of the ways in which a doctor could wound. Now, the thing is that errors are probably, of course, they don't accompany excellent medicine, but because medicine is empirical, experiential, and humans are fallible, we learn what kind of errors we're going to make, right? So this is something we find out that, the, for example, a physician or nurse was involved in this medical error. Now we realize, oh, we shouldn't, we should label these things differently or put them in different uh, size jars or something to try to prevent that error. But, but the, the type of uh, uh, wounding that Hippocrates is especially concerned with is what I would call role conflation, right? Where this, the healer would actually set out to wound. It wouldn't be a wound of therapy. It wouldn't be an error, which is inadvertent, unintentional, not deliberate. Uh, it would actually be where the physician says, no, I'm going to adopt the role of a wound or I'm going to actually wound or I'm in the instance that we're particularly concerned about, I am going to give a deadly drug on purpose, right? And uh, this is where Hippocrates draws the line and says, uh, we, we, this is just unacceptable. And that's why in the, in, the, uh, in the oath, we have a deadly drug I will not give even if I am asked, nor will I suggest this plan, right? Um, here is, here's Margaret Mead, the anthropologist um, she's talking about the Hippocratic Oath, and she says, attributing this to the Hippocratic Oath, for the first time in our tradition, there is a complete separation between killing and curing. Throughout the primitive world, the doctor and the sorcerer tended to be the same person. He with power to kill had power to cure, including especially the undoing of his own killing activities. He, had power to, he who had power to cure would necessarily also be able to kill. With the Greeks, the distinction was made clear. One profession, of course, just interjecting here, me is talking about the promise. It's a profession. It's a promise, right? A profession is standing before other people and promising that I will not kill. I will not use a deadly drug, even if someone asks me. Uh, going back to Mead's quote, one profession was to be dedicated completely to life under all circumstances, right? So it's dedicated to only to healing, not to wounding, not to deliberately wounding or deliberately killing, right? This is a priceless possession. Again, this is mead, which we cannot afford to tarnish. But society is always attempting to make the physician into a killer. 
It's always trying to do this, me is drawing to our attention. And then she's, she ends, and I will end the quote. It is the duty of society to protect the physician from such requests. So it's obviously Hippocrates was asked to kill, right? He was asked to kill. That's why he says, I will not give a deadly drug even if I am asked uh, for, by someone, nor will I suggest this, right? So what forms does this take uh, in, our, in our contemporary culture? Um, I distinguish two, two forms. Uh, the one I call Asclepian, uh, after the ancient Greek uh, demigod of medicine, where death is regarded as therapeutic, right? So it's, it's thought that well, death is a thing that could be good for a patient. So I will prescribe death, right? Here we see Perseus. This is from the Fusi Gallery uh, or, uh, yeah, the uh, Academia. I'm not entirely sure. It's in Florence. It's a bronze of uh, Perseus holding up the head of Medusa. Asclepius received the two vials of blood, uh, mythologically, we're told, that uh, from the, the, the Medusa the Gorgon, uh, one of which he could use to heal, one of which he could use to kill. So the idea was he could he could heal or kill, um, and that he could propose death as a kind of therapy. That's kind of a view you get, I think, oftentimes, death it could be a therapeutic intervention for a physician. And of course, Hippocrates would reject that. I'm going to argue against that view. Another uh, idea or view we get, I call Apollonian, after the Greek god Apollo. Um, and this would be the view that, uh, and Hippocrates swears to both Apollo and to Asclepius at the beginning of the oath, but the Apollonian view, and this is from this, uh, we're, we're looking at a depiction of uh, at the beginning of Homer's uh, Iliad where Apollo spreads disease amongst the Greeks. That's, that's a depiction of what we're looking at there because Apollo was the god of plague as well. The idea of being something like, well, death is harmful, but medicine is just a technique, right? So medicine, death is bad. And in, in this way, the Apollonian view says, no, death is a bad thing. But doctors are good at killing and medicine is just a technique. It's not oriented towards a specific goal such as health. It could be oriented towards health or sickness. And therefore, it makes perfect sense to have physicians kill because doctors are technicians and they're the best at it. So why not have one, someone do it well rather than someone do it badly, right? And that's the, what I call the Apollonian view. Um, uh, we, we look at uh, the Apollonian view, we see that, for example, in the guillotine, right? Dr. Guillotine, uh, Ignatius, Ignatius Guillotine was a physician. And his colleague Luis was a surgeon. Uh, the, 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 the mechanism for killing had existed prior to Guillotine and Luis, but uh, Luis especially perfected it uh, at the time of the French Revolution or just prior to it. And, um, and Guillotine was an advocate of this was, he's, because he felt like, well, the way people were killed in France at the time he proposed uh, this me mechanism of killing, what he called my machine, um, was grisly. It was grisly. It was inelegant. It wasn't egalitarian. It was, uh, it was badly done. And, and, and uh, uh, Guillotine thought, I could do much better. We could do this a lot, much, much better, right? Of course, you could understand his sentiment, but, it, but when he proposed it, before the French assembly, everyone laughed, of course, because of the incongruity of a physician who is devoted to healing, proposing you know, a speedy way of killing people, right? That's ludicrous, right? It's something uh, incongruous in that, of course. And that's what Hippocrates wants us to remember, that physicians should be devoted exclusively to healing, not, not thinking about how they could kill easily or well or efficiently, right? So. Now, with respect to the, uh, the Asclepian uh, point that, well, maybe death sometimes could be therapeutic, it's just, it's, it's nonsense. Death destroys the subject, right? Death cannot be a way of taking care of the subject. I'm not saying that uh, we might not want to euthanize, say, our dogs or cats or something like that, but it's not because it's a way of taking care of them. 
it destroys the subject, it eliminates the subject. And therapy requires that the subject remains while we take care of the subject. You can't have a therapy, something that's taking care of a subject that destroys the subject, right? So the idea that we could use death as a therapy is nonsense. And uh, it's important to just note that it's just simply nonsense because, of the, because conceptually, therapy requires that the subject lives through the therapy, actually lives through that interaction, that in intervention, right? So it's, it can never be therapeutic, okay? Um, now, what other reasons do we have for, uh, for saying physicians should not kill? Well, one is uh, trust. I'm, um, this is a depiction, this is of, of Alexander the Great and his physician, Philip. And what's going on there is um, told to us by Plutarch. And uh, I, won't, I won't read it to us, but you can find this in Plutarch's lives. And it's depicted in, there are many depictions of it in beautiful paintings, wonderful paintings. Many artists have devoted their energies to depicting this interaction. But what's going on there is Philip uh, is drinking a potion that, excuse me, Alexander is drinking a potion that Philip has given to him. And uh, Alexander has just given Philip, the physician, a, a letter that he received, that Alexander had received from one of Alexander's generals, Parmenio, saying that Philip, your physician, is going to kill you. And um, while Philip reads that letter, Alexander drinks the potion that Philip has given to him so that he could recover from the sickness, from which he does recover. And actually, I should note that at some point subsequent, I'm not sure exactly how how long after this, Alexander has Parmenio, the general, killed, put to death. So the point here is that Alexander trusted his physician, Philip, because he knew, being a physician, that Philip just would not kill. He, he knew that. He knew that Philip, given the ethos of the Greek physician and the Hippocratic tradition, I, I'm not claiming that Philip was a Hippocratic physician, I don't know, but but we do know that that ethos was um, was was well widespread at this time. And, and that Alexander would just know that Philip's not going to kill him. Um, so he could take, and that trust of course is very important. Even Alexander the Great, who probably at that time was the most powerful man in the world, right? He needed to be able to trust his physician. Um, another, another reason uh, for physicians not to get involved in killing is, it, is, it, is because it medicalizes what really isn't medical, right? If you look at Hamlet's question, to be or not to be, that is not a medical question. And medicine is not doing itself any favors by, by, by accepting the claim of those who say, well, that's really a medical question. It's not, it's an existential question. It is a question, it's a philosophical question. It's a theological question. It's a question, it's a dramatic question, but it's not a medical question. And so medicine does not do itself any favors, nor do we do any medicine any favors by asking medical physicians and nurses to get involved in this question of, you know, whether it is better to exist or not to exist. That's just not a medical question, nor should we medicalize that question, which is a totally legitimate question, but not a medical one. Um, also, this is, I'm uh, in Marin uh, County in Northern California, just over, just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And this is a, an instance of uh, a young man, um, uh, Kevin Berthia, at the time he's 22, this is taken in 2005. Fortunately, he did not jump. The, the, the police officer was able to talk him off the ledge. But uh, Herbert Hendon, who's a great authority on suicide, and particularly suicide in America, he's a site was a psychiatrist, medical doctor, said that the, the, the getting in physicians involved in killing, so physician assisted suicide, euthanasia, and things like that, he says, is just going to jeopardize the lives of many vulnerable other people, not terminally ill people, but just people who just are thinking that, you know, maybe death is the answer. Maybe death is the resolution of my problems. Hendon notes that if you, if you have physicians starting to get involved in saying, well, no, death is actually a therapy. Death is a solution to complex problems. Hendon said this will just frustrate, utterly frustrate our, our ability to reduce suicide, to prevent suicide amongst the wider population. The one thing that, um, that 
we know about suicide is that suicides lead to suicides. And uh, if, if we have physicians involved in killing and in assisting people to, to kill themselves, this is going to really be pernicious for vulnerable others. It also conf what confuses medical deliberation, right? If you think about Aristotle, uh, whose father was a physician, the great ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, who actually grew up in the, in the uh, in, he was a member of Phil Alexander the Great's uh, household. Uh, the, Alexander the Great was the son of Philip, the king of Macedonia, and Aristotle's father was the physician to Philip, the king of Macedonia's court. So Aristotle said, well, physicians, they, he, they don't deliberate about whether they're going to heal, right? Or whether they're going to produce health. That's a fixed goal. Given that fixed goal, they then deliberate, right? But if we start to introduce like, uh, well, should I kill my patient? Should I give my patient a lethal drug? Or should I treat my patient's sickness? That will utterly confuse and confound medical deliberation, right? You can't, it's just like a judge asking herself, should I bring about justice or injustice? You, you can't deliberate once you introduce of ends that are so opposed to one another, it will utterly confound deliberation in that profession. It will also, uh, this is a, uh, Emil J. Freirich, who is a medical doctor, oncologist, hematologist, cancer biologist, who uh, revolutionized the treatment of uh, childhood leukemia. And he did so with treatments that were really, at least prior to uh, success, they were very grisly very difficult, very challenging, obnoxious ordeal, really arduous treatments to undergo, right? But um, they ended up, we ended up, Mr. Dr. Freyrich uh, ended up really reducing the, uh, the lethality of childhood leukemia dramatically. It used to be a death sentence. And after his remarkable work, it, it, it was no longer a death sentence for a child to have leukemia. But if we were, if, if I claim that if we have uh, killing as an option, right, there will be uh, medical progress that we will not realize because we'll say, well, we have a treatment for this disease. It's a lethal drug. We have a treatment for that illness. Here, here it is. We're not, we don't need to uh, undergo these arduous or, ordeals uh, any longer because we have a treatment, namely a lethal drug. And I, I would claim that that will definitely impede medical progress, because if you have a treatment for, a, for a, 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 a grisly disease, why do you need to try to come up with an alternative if you already have one? If, if death really is a therapy, uh, it will impede medical progress. And, and finally, um, I'm down the street from uh, San Quentin. And which is the, the, Cal, the only prison in, in California. It's a state prison where they administer the death penalty, although fortunately I haven't done that in a while. But um, physicians, of course, are often asked and in fact are required in some uh, locales to administer the death penalty, right? If, if doctors start to get involved in saying, well, death is a therapy, we can, death medicine is a technique, right? Then we're going to have powerful other interests like the state, who will say, well, look, we want you to administer the death penalty because, in fact, only you can administer the death penalty because you're the only ones that are good at it. Um, this has actually occurred in the states. And so if medicine doesn't observe this line and say, no, I will not give a deadly drug, it becomes much more difficult for it to resist these other, other sources that, as Mead notes, wants to get it involved in giving a deadly drug. Um, this is a quote from the epidemics, right, where uh, Hipparchus says, as to diseases, practice to uh, help or at least do not harm, right? Which is where we get, where we get this um, statement. Uh, it actually probably does originally come from the uh, Hippocrates epidemics and it's translated into Latin. I think uh, Lactantius is, seems to be a good source of that, the um, Christian apologist. But we, we get the Latin primum non notre. You might be more familiar with that, primum non notre. First, do no harm, right? First, do no harm. Um, Galen noted, wow, I, I can't believe it. it was beneath Hippocrates to say that. But Galen said, the great uh, 
uh, physician of the third century or thereabouts said, you know, I really came to realize that that was a great principle. First, do no harm. And of course, killing is harming. So it would, it's not compatible with not harming, with observing this principle, very basic principle of not harming. And then finally, let me come to a conclusion. I'm not, I hope you don't mind the levity. Um, uh, there you have a bottle of wine, right? I'm not far from Napa and Sonoma, which are regions famous for their wonderful California wine. And um, we have the physician sort of saying, well, we're going to have to unplug this bottle of wine. It can't breathe any longer. The point being here, just want to note that not killing, right, ob observing the not giving a deadly drug does not mean that, the visit, that we have to do everything, right? Um, a. H. Klaus said, thou shalt not kill, but needst not strive officiously to keep alive, right? He said that humorously, but we can observe that uh, boundary, noting that it's one thing to commit the physicians not to kill, right? Don't give a deadly drug. It doesn't mean you have to do everything. It doesn't mean you, you can't uh, remove a ventilator. It doesn't mean you have to give people every single form of chemotherapy that's available. People are allowed to die. People are allowed to be removed from ventilators, removed from vests, um, from ventilators. Uh, excuse me, I repeat myself there, but we're able to forego medical interventions because we're allowing the natural processes to take place. We are not deliberately killing when we do that. So um, that's the conclusion of my talk. And uh, I went a little longer than I would uh, hoped to, but let me stop sharing there. And I'm uh, happy to entertain questions or, um, yeah, any comments or criticisms or anything. Thank, thank you for, for your attention. Yeah. I see, uh, oh, there's Father Kevin Flannery. Hello, Father, good to see you. And uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, other, other individuals there, but uh, thank, thank you for your, uh, your attention. Well, thank you, Professor. I mean, I just want to uh, thank you on behalf of all of us. That was um, a great um, introduction there. Um, very, lots of um, things I didn't know anyway. Um, really enjoyed it. So I think we'll just open the floor up to questions since we've still got um, time for that and have a bit of a discussion. Okay. Some of those issues you raised. If anyone's got any. And you can type them in the chat as well if that if people want to do that. I have a couple of questions, if I may. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. It's just been really interesting. And um, I'm working now. I'm working a lot on the abortion. So my questions, I mean, uh, is also related to this issue. And um, you said that uh, one, the first view of death is the Asclepian view, which is um, which considers death as something good for the patient, so therapeutic. And this is why I believe uh, um, it's common to consider abortion therapeutic, because. Um, but as you said. Uh, uh, that destroys the subject, so is um, it cannot be considered therapeutic. So my question is that uh, uh, what happens when two subjects are at stake? In case of abortion, there is uh, the pregnant woman and the embryo, and um, and. So when we said that uh, abortion is therapeutic, it's therapeutic for the pregnant woman, of course. Moreover, about the embryo, there are, it's very much controversial if it can be considered a subject from the beginning. And, um, and so this is my first question. My second one is about... Uh, um, when you said that, uh, um, when we tend to medicalize what is not medical, so when uh, we, I mean, if it's uh, if it's if a life is worth living is not a, a medical issue, but is more a moral issue, philosophical issue. 
But uh, how this uh, thing is compatible with the fact that uh, medicine is now considered very much a holistic, uh, um, uh, and, and we have a holistic view of medicine. So when we, when a doctor see the patient, he, uh, he has to look at the patient from many perspectives. Uh, medical, physical, uh, mental, and even social. So when it comes for, to abortion, I mean, um, almost uh, every abortion, not every abortion, but it's very common to say that uh, an abortion is therapeutic for the woman, for because it can be harmful having a baby, not for for her mental health, for instance, or because her social conditions uh, are quite incompatible with the pregnancy. So I was wondering how all these issues can can be uh, considered when you say that, um, of course, uh, uh, we cannot uh, medicalize what is not medical, but uh, I mean, I hope it's clear. I, I think I, I do understand. I hope I hope I do. Let, may I, let me try. So, yeah, as, uh, um, Ilaria, is it? Ilaria? Yes, correct. Ilaria. Um, yeah. Ilaria. So, um, so you're, yeah, the, the, you, you went right to the heart of the issue of abortion, right? Where you, you have the welfare of two parties, right? But their, their relationship is utterly unique. Mm -hmm. That is, we, the one thing I would say is we just cannot understand that relationship in terms of other relationships, right? So, you know, famously, um, uh, Jar Judith Jarvis Thompson tries to understand the relationship between the mother and the child in terms of the relation between an individual and a stranger, right? And, and that's just miss, miss uh, it's a, we can't reduce the mother-child relationship to any other relationship. <laughs> it's, it's a unique relationship. And it's, a, it's an utterly unique relationship between two human beings. It's, we don't have anything else like it. Uh, I think that's important for us to realize from the start, we all, all of us, I've been recently thinking about what are the implications of having a navel, you know, um, and uh, the, the marks on our body, right? And, and one of the implications is that, you know, each one of us depended upon a, a woman uh, for our life, right? That, that's a definite implication of having a navel. Um, so, so the one, the, I would just say that we can't, we can't think of this in terms of any other relationship. It, it's it's got to be thought of in terms of this relationship. Um, the one the one thing uh, that you yeah the so you do bring up uh, the crucial issue of the therapeutic. Well, it's therapeutic with respect to one of the parties, right? But utterly destructive with respect to another member of the party. And I, I would say also uh, another to the to the child to the baby. Um, so, but as therapeutic uh, for, for the one member, it, it of course isn't therapeutic to, to her in so, sh so, so far as she's a mother, right? It's, it's therapeutic to her, uh, towards her in a different respect, not, not with respect to her, to her motherhood, right? Because that's actually her, the life of her child is jeopardized, uh, is actually taken in a, in a therapeutic abortion. So, but, 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 that's, but that is a conundrum it's a conundrum, definitely. And um, the one hopefully helpful thing I could say that what's interesting is when I mentioned earlier that this boundary, observing this boundary helps medicine to progress, what was very interesting in the, development of, in the development of the cesarean section, there's a wonderful pamphlet that's published by the American Board of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And it was by a medical historian whose name escapes me, uh, but it's, it's called the history of the cesarean section. And um, it's, it, um, you can easily find it. Uh, 
I think Sewell is the author's name. It's readily available on the internet. And it's commissioned by the American Board of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And what's interesting in this medical historian from Johns Hopkins in Maryland, uh, Baltimore, in the United States, notes that the cesarean section was developed principally, was perfected or brought to uh, a, a greater uh, progress by French physicians, French uh, obstetricians, because they did not want to resort to the alternative at the time, which, which is uh, uh, killing the baby, what's called uh, an, a destructive craniotomy. The French obstetricians did not want to do that. And this, uh, this historian notes that the French developed the cesarean section more quickly than their British counterparts. No, no offense to any Brits here, but um, in part because the, the French physicians were loath to at the alternative, which was killing, which was uh, killing the baby. And, and, and she notes that even they, the French exceeded the British with respect to the cesarean section, even though the British were more advanced at the time when it came to abdominal surgery. They were more advanced than the British. So in the, in the history of medicine, in the history of medicine, that's a, that's a very, I think, clear example where the physician's saying, we're not going to, we're not gonna kill, we're not gonna kill. They come up with alternatives. And it's important for us to realize that by saying um, we're not going to resort to a therapeutic abortion, we can come up with alternatives. We can come up with alternatives. Even uh, a famous case in Phoenix called the Phoenix um, uh, abortion case that is about a decade old. There, the woman who had that uh, abortion in, in Phoenix, Arizona, in the United States of America, I don't, sorry, those are the cases I'm familiar with. I don't mean to just use American examples, but, but um, that particular case involved, she had primary pulmonary hypertension, uh, which is, uh, is often incompatible with successful delivery of a, a child to term in pregnancy. But there are obstetricians and gynecologists and, and teams pulmonologists, cardiologists, who successfully deliver children <laughs> of women who pr have primary pulmonary hypertension. And they, but the thing is that they're just, uh, um, I mean, they're remark, they're just, they're, they're at the cutting edge of uh, their, their, their profession. And, um, but the thing is that, you see, that's what I'm saying about, by saying we're not going to kill, that's not an option. Then you come up with the alternatives. What are the alternatives? And there really are alternatives, but we don't necessarily know what they are. Just as it, it probably looked pretty grim to those French obstetricians delivering a child, uh, a cesarean section, which didn't kill the mother, right? Uh, that was, that was, that looked like, well, I don't know if we're ever going to be able to do it. And yet they did. It, they did do it, right? So that, that's the one thing. And then, um, yeah, with respect to the other question, uh, 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 Ilaria, the the holistic. I think that what I would I would probably offer a distinction. I hopefully it's helpful. The physicians take a holistic view of things, but they're still practicing a specific discipline, right? So they have so they take a holistic view, a, a view of the whole person, but they're still addressing problems that are uniquely addressed by medicine, right? So that they're not, they're not, uh, by taking a holistic view, they are not thereby becoming uh, universal, capable of universal uh, interventions in any aspect of hum human life. But they do take a holistic view of, and in fact, that holistic view will often tell them, this is really not under their purview, <laughs> right there. This is not their problem. Yeah, uh, yeah. So hopefully that is helpful. Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Patricia, go ahead. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much indeed. 
Anthony, uh, for, for a fascinating talk. I missed quite a bit of it because I lost my signal here in County Kildare in Ireland for about 20 minutes and even my hotspot, I couldn't use that. So my apologies. But I want to ask you, um, firstly, an observation. Reading the Hippocratic Oath, it applies to much more than the life issues, even though they're, of course, central to what every doctor does. But I'm a psychiatrist and so it applies in my specialty as well in relation to confidentiality um, and not doing any harm, uh, abstaining from harm. That means exercising care and caution in what we do. And I, I recent, I'm, I'm a visiting professor in Notre Dame in Australia. And I recently had the task of giving a talk on the ethics of psychiatric diagnosis in which I'm interested because I'm very concerned about the proliferation of psychiatric diagnoses with very little um, evidence. So they're, they're not evidence-based, many of them, even some of the ones we use currently frequently, such as the personality disorders, haven't been shown to be valid. And I'm wondering, does the Hippo can the Hippocratic Oath be applied to the area of evidence-based medicine, particularly where life and death isn't at issue, but things like stigma, things like side effects of medication apply? Um, yeah, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Well, the, the Oath is, is uh, I think, has a humility there. Um, Regimens I will use for the benefit of the patient, of patients according to my according to my uh, ability and judgment, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So there's a there's a sense of uh, limit. There's a sense of the 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 arts limit, right? Um, and that uh, and also the yeah the the do no harm, which is not found in the oath. I mean that not stated yeah. there it's in epidemics, but certainly it's in the oath. I mean it's it's all about not harming. Um, uh, it, it, it's very interesting that, that the, as I mentioned there, um, Galen, who was a, a, a great commentator on Hippocrates, probably the greatest, he said when he first saw that in the epidemics, he thought it was beneath Hippocrates. He said, this is beneath Hippocrates to say, do no harm. He said, how could, you know, this is beneath him. <laughs> Was that because it was so obvious that one shouldn't do harm? Exactly, exactly, yes. But the thing, but, but what Galen said is, he said, that was the view of my youth. But now that I have practiced medicine, of course, Galen was, uh, he was a physician to gladiators in Rome and also Marcus Aurelius's physician, right? So he was, he, uh, he, he uh, was in Rome and um, he, he said, but as I practice medicine, I came to realize how brilliant this was, what a brilliant observation it is and how crucial it is not to harm. And, and, and so I think that um, th that sentiment of the day, uh, medicine is, a, is dangerous. And I think um, people who really appreciate the, it, the weight of the gravity of um, intervening realize that uh, and so, will do so with kind of moderation and, and humility. And that I think is definitely, there's that, that tenor of moderation, humility, uh, beware of, um, of um, unconsidered intervention, you know, that, that's definitely part of the, the Hippocratic sentiment, the Hippocratic ethos. Thank you very much. Is, it, is there any other questions? Helen, go on, go on. Oh, Helen, you're still muted. Yes, you? It's a question about medical research, really, because that's an area where there's a sense in which you're not doing medicine because you don't yet know what's going to benefit the patient. And yet it's, it's against a background of humility and, you know, care not to, not to, not to do harm at the same time, but there is the potential with medical research for doctors to, 
to be doing things that don't look so much like medicine because they're not. I mean, this is how you get medicine, but you know, you, you may be very unlikely to benefit the individual patient you know, who's part of your trial. So I wonder whether you had any thoughts about that. Well, the, the first thought I would have is that uh, not, not to be uh, glib or anything, but, but that um, medicine is always empirical. It's um, even, that's like uh, the point about the errors, you know, we're always learning. Medicine is always learning. We're always continuing the induction to some extent. Um, no, I don't want to say that that's research. It's not research, but, but, we're, but it's empirical. It's always experiential. So I think that in, given that it is empirical, experiential, and it's always going to be taking into account what happens when we do something, then it, of course, it makes sense that it would begin in experiment, um, it, right? It, it, that the empirical, like, like say Jenner, let's say if I could take that example of Jenner. Now, the thing is that, you know, we, when we look at Jenner, that I had that one slide of Jenner, um, uh, the, the vaccination. When you look at Jenner um, 1796, I think it's May 14th, 1796. So not, we're not far from the anniversary. Well, he gave, um, he gave, we, we probably wouldn't uh, endorse his, his, his conduct wouldn't live up to our norms of today for sure. Um, but, but he took, uh, he took matter from the milk, the nurse, uh, excuse me, the milkmaid's uh, wounds from cowpox, and he inoculated or, or put that into the into the uh, skin of this little boy, Phipps, uh, eight-year-old, and that conferred um, immunity to smallpox, which was much more uh, dangerous for the little eight-year-old. But of course, it wasn't as if the eight-year-old was suffering from uh, from uh, smallpox uh, or anything like that. Um, so. That, that brings up all sorts of issues, right, about um, is that a therapeutic act? Uh, I, I'm not confident it is myself, uh, although it's certainly oriented towards therapy ultimately. Um, it's in, it probably important to note that this boy Phipps, um, eventually he, he ended up living on Jenner's uh, property at Jenner's charitable you know, Jenner actually gave him a house in which to live with his family and things like that. And, and they were remained, I guess, lifetime friends. They're buried in the same uh, church cemetery. Um, but I've kind of gone off track here with this, this historical example. I'm, I'm sorry. But, but the, uh, the, the, the point, um, Helen, I would say it would be that um, medicine is experiential. It's empirical. So, so it, it naturally begins in experiment. And that experiment will always be part of medicine. And medicine is always experimental, even, even after we've conducted many experiments. Um, and so the, but the ethics of practice, which is what Hippocrates is talking about, would, I think they're continuous with the ethics of experimentation, but they're, but they're probably different. Yeah, they're, they're continuous with them, but they're, but they're different and, and, um, some of them, some of the things associated with them will certainly be of the age in which they occur, right? So, I mean, now we emphasize autonomy, inf informed consent, all these kinds of things. Those are, of course, important values, but they might, to some extent, they are values of our age, of our concern. They're not necessarily perennial concerns, right? So, I, I don't know if I've, if I've gotten nearby an answer to your question. I've got a little... Uh, I tend to go off on uh, historical examples. I find them so rich and and uh, and uh, engaging um, and and instructive. But um, yeah, does that does that answer your question about the, so the Hippocrates is talking about the ethics of practicing? Practice is ex empirical; it's not experimental, but it began in experiment, and and so I think these ethics are continuous with, but not identical to the ethics of experimentation. Yes, I, I, suppose it, I suppose it interests me because the same person is, is, is being a scientist and then being a doctor. And of course, you know, you, you must still respect your patients in the sense that you mustn't endanger them unduly. Um, but, you know, you could argue that while the patient, while the doctor's conducting a trial, 
the doctor is acting as as a scientist more than a doctor you know with an eye to any harm that the scientist may be causing but you know but as a scientist for the purposes of the trial right you know right. hoping well, I, hoping I, to be a doctor with the results of the trial maybe but yeah um well, yeah, I, th I think that's right. To th that, I like the way you put that. I mean, uh, nicely put. That is the role. You, you're occupying two roles. They're not, ex they're not mutually exclusive. They don't mutually exclude each other. If they were, then that would be a problem. Um, or or they're, we have to make sure that they aren't mutually exclusive. We have to make sure that they're not ex mutually exclusive or they're not, there's nothing going on in that scientific role that would that would that would be incompatible in principle with the role of the physician, the care, the therapeutic role. Um, but may, maybe the like as you said, maybe the role one role becomes more pronounced over the other, right? And as and hopefully, yeah, that that initial role of scientist, well, I would maintain that that role is never eliminated from the practice of medicine. Actually, it's never eliminated from the practice of medicine. And in fact, I think we find with the COVID vaccines, we're finding that, right? We, now we know, for example, that um, uh, we found out things about, uh, we found out things that you don't find out when you just do, when you just vaccinate 35,000 people, you find out when you vaccinate 3 million people or 5 million people, we find out new things. And so th that role of scientist is still present in the role of their, of, clinician of the therapeutic intervention, but it's been diminished, right? So, but I like to, I hope that is faithful to your, your thought. Uh, that, that's, I think, a helpful way to think about it. That, you know, Alistair McIntyre has a wonderful article about uh, medical error uh, with Samuel Gorovitz. And uh, it was one of the first articles published in a, in a, in a I forget what, it was a medical ethical journal and it's on how you know research is always really going on because medicine is empirical it's experiential it's it's affected by what happens we learn things we learn things in the practice of medicine that we didn't know um, so that scientific aspect is always present and it's important for us to not to forget that I think that's why we, when we think about the vaccines, we realize like, well, we're gonna learn things. We're going to learn things that, that we didn't know based on clinical trials. Uh, and that's part of medicine. Doctors learn, physicians learn things all the time. It's an empirical practice. Father Flanner, did you have a comment on that? You wanted to come in? I did, I, it's not exactly on that point, but uh, first of all, let me apologize, Tom. I, I, arrived late. I had other things going on. Oh, so, thank, thank you um, for coming. Thank you for coming. Okay. It's good to see you, Tom. Um, good to see you, too. Uh, my question would actually be, you know, would have, in a sense, something to do with these developments in medicine. And and, uh, and, I was, and I've been thinking about, you know, the Phoenix case that you mentioned in which, you know, the, the woman's life was actually in danger. You know, uh, did she... Uh, give birth, etc. And uh, but um, I've been talking. To, I've been at uh, Creighton University uh, in Omaha for this this year, and uh, talking to, to a number of people um, active in, in bioethics and, and medical ethics, and and uh, and one of the uh, individuals suggested to me that um, in a situation like that, um, situation like similar to what happened at, at Phoenix that uh, one possibility may have been or could be in the future to actually uh, induce birth uh, patrician and and, uh, um, and yet it may actually be known you know by the um, the doctor or the you know the doctors that uh, um, a child would be born but could really, only survive for a couple of hours, and uh, and my question would be whether you would regard that as uh, a legitimate action. You know, of course, you've you've done a lot of work on the on the principle of double effect, and and uh, but I um, I would just uh, uh, like your uh, 
to know your opinion on that, actually your advice, you know, on how to, how to deal with something like that. Right. So in, induction of premature birth. Of, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I don't, I don't just, I've, I've not thought of that before, but, um, but just think just on the, you know, initially it, I would think that would be problematic um, to induce premature birth because I guess, because if you think of the kind of thing you're, you're talking about, um, the induction of birth is there's nothing problematic. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but the, we're inducing birth prematurely. Um, and in which you, in which you actually know that survival could be only brief. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, the induction of, because pr premature birth is, is actually uh, something we try to avoid. Right. So, to, to my mind, the induction of premature birth would would be, you know, that would be to intend harm to the to the baby who's being prematurely born, and I, I don't think it's 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 not going to be comparable to the hysterectomy or because you're you're actually doing something in itself legitimate when you perform a hysterectomy, and it 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 just so happens that the that the uterus is impregnated, sure. gravid, yeah. right? Um, but it's not as if you're doing something else in inducing premature birth. Um, so I don't know, just, just, it seems like the object, the thing that you're doing is problematic. Um, the actual induction of a premature birth. Um, now, and, and particularly that, I mean, now, you know, um, I don't know what the limit is, I think even, 17 weeks or uh i mean pre premature babies are being uh cared for in neonatal in intensive care units uh very at a very um well not that you know 17 or i think i don't know what the limit is right now but uh, i know that we've gone earlier than 22 and we we um we're able to do, we're able to take care of that, that infant. Um, so I don't know what we were talking about, um, what age we're talking about, but it sounds like we're, we're talking about uh, inducing birth where there's not really even any reason to think we could care for this baby in an NICU, right? Um, yeah. and to me, that seems like, it's one thing if you induce it, with a good sense, like, well, we'll be able to put that baby in the, in the neonate intensive care unit. We've got a good chance to take care of that baby. That's, that seems like a different kind of circumstance from uh, doing it when, yeah, we don't, we don't have, that's not really an option as far as we're concerned. Okay, thanks, Tom. I would that's, say that that's... there might be cases where you could induce premature birth in order to, you know, for the sake of the life of the mom, if you really, really are committed to, and you have good reason to think we could, we can take care of this baby. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it's not uh, ideal, obviously, but, but if you do that in circumstances where, you, you know, that's not an option, I don't, I don't, I don't see how that could be legit. My understanding is, Again, there's a lot to know, and PPH, which is what that woman in Phoenix suffered from, is a very grave disease. It's a very grave disease to have, and it is very dangerous for a woman to be pregnant. But there are there are teams of people who have successfully cared for women who have primary pulmonary hypertension. And that particular woman, my understanding is she had had she had had a number of uh, children that she brought to to birth while she had primary pulmonary hypertension. I think this is her third or fourth pregnancy. Uh, so, the, the, but you need to go to the people who, there, there are not that many people who can take care of a woman who has PPH, but there are some. Do you have, you know, a reference, you know, to some? Uh, oh, you could, you could, if you, for, for uh, primary pulmonary successful. Yeah, people, successful yeah, I birth, think you, you know, even given. Yeah. You could, you could, um, I, I can look, but I, I know that at the time, when I've looked previously, you look for uh, 
care care you know for women with PPH, PPH yeah. pulmonary hypertension, pregnant women with PPH, where you have these are very they're cutting edge. They're like uh, pulmonologists, cardiologists, obstetrician, gynecologists, who are who are just th it's intensive care for the woman. Uh, it's not as if she's going to stay at home. It's intensive care, but they have successfully. delivered babies of mothers who had primary pulmonary hypertension. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you for your question. There's actually um, um, Anthony um, and Helen who are both joining us tonight have actually written a paper on issues of conflict um, between uh, baby health and mother health in pregnancy. So that's just been linked in okay. the comments if anyone's interested. So very rich in uh, very rich um, area for discussion right. um, and Patricia is also asking on in follow-up to that um, I, I think you mentioned it a little bit you know there's a very important to say how premature the induction happens right. because of the danger of death and disability if the baby survives yes um, and I would just add finally we actually had a bio seminar um, with a young doctor, Dr. Tony Saad, who is currently working on a paper that argues that abortion is never medically necessary because in every context that you can claim that it's medically necessary, you could deliver the baby. Um, so that, that's another kind of area of, of discussion there. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, Th thank you. Uh, thank you, Fiona. Yeah, yeah. yeah this, I, this kind of relates to. Yo, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no. You go ahead. I was just going to say that that relates to a question I was going to ask you, um, just about the difference between active and passive killing, um, and how the the oath would would interact with that. Um, so, of course, you know this seems like as good an example as any to focus on. So, of course, when you induce a baby that you know will die, um, you you haven't killed the baby uh, intentionally because you, of course, hope it will survive. There are cases of very young, premature babies surviving. Um, but if it has a very small likelihood, you've pro it probably will die. Um, and so there's a there's a distinction there between the kind of active and passive killing that's going on. Um, and then, of course, if you were to take the other approach and uh, not induce the baby and let the mother die, then that would be a kind of case of letting die that, that would be seen as negligence in a kind of modern medical context often. So, so you know, I j just wonder how your thoughts on like, how the oath would, would interact with that distinction? So um, I think that the oath draws our attention to what an agent does deliberately, right? So I will not give a deadly drug, right? So um, of, of course, the, the, the allowing things to occur wouldn't be as salient for the ancient Greek physician, right? In part because the armamentarium is limited Right, so your the, the prominence of allowing coincides with our ability to prevent death. Right, so as one's ability to prevent death increases, so does the phenomenon of allowing allowing to occur. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't put a lot of weight on the on the distinction between what we do and what we allow, but rather more on what we what we deliberate. What are we bringing about deliberately? Right, what are what are we dedicated our our, 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 our deliberation to, right? What are we trying to do? How are we planning to affect it or to allow it, right? Um, so so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't make the, dis although I do think the distinction between what we do and what we allow is an important one. I, I think that the, the one that um, comes to mind when you read the oath is what, what is the agent doing deliberately, right? So when the physician says, I will not give a deadly drug even if I am asked for it, well, we could, the contrast maybe that might come more quickly to mind isn't so much the issues of abortion, which is a very important issue and that the oath does talk about not giving 
a destructive pessary, right? So the oath does for, forbid abortion, certainly. Um, but just to focus on not giving a deadly drug, right? Currently, um, at the end of life, sometimes we, in order to relieve uh, agonal pain, a physician might need to sedate a patient. Rarely this occurs. Ira Biok, who's a former president of the American Hospice Association, a medical doctor here in Southern California in the United States, he talks about a case of Mrs. Matthews in his wonderful book, Dying Well. And he, he said I, he wasn't able to take care of Mrs. Matthews' pain absent of actually sedating her, giving her a sedative, putting her under gen basically general anesthetic, which he knew was going to render her unconscious so that she was not aware of the pain and she was not uh, in agony as she was when she was conscious, but would also depress or suppress her respiration, result in her death, right? But, and he's a, an opponent of physician suicide and euthanasia, but if you look at his deliberations, in some sense, someone would say, oh, he violated the Hippocratic Oath because he gave a deadly drug, right? But actually, he didn't give the drug insofar as it was deadly. He did not choose that sedative with the goal of bringing about Mrs. Matthews' death. He chose the sedative because it would render her unconscious. He chose it in light of its ability to, uh, to render her unconscious so that she was not aware of the pain and she did not suffer the pain which was agonal through which she was, uh, or the ordeal she, through which she was going. So when we say, I will not give a deadly drug, what Hippocrates is saying is I'm not going to give a deadly drug insofar as it is deadly. I'm not going to choose a drug based on its lethality. And uh, Dr. Biok abided by that uh, prohibition. Not, he did not choose a drug in light of its deadliness, right? So, um, so the Hippocratic Oath, as at the very end of my talk, I hope to just gesture towards saying, well, not giving a deadly drug does not mean that the physician will never be causally involved in the death of his or her patient. That does not, that's not what that commitment uh, commits one to. What it commits one to is not seeking the death of one's patient, not adopting the role of killer as a killer, right? So um, that, that's, that's what that commits one to. And that's talking about what is one deliberating about? What is one choosing to do? What is one's plan? What are one's purposes and, and means? And that, and that we find in what we deliberate about and, and choose to do.